opening day. The Buckeyes and Huskies headline a great slate today as College Game Day kicks off our 10th season on the road and the journey to New Orleans and the national championship game begins. of the championship game. It's a great time of year. Nine and a half hours to kick off in Columbus as more than 100,000 tonight will welcome Washington to the home of the defending national champions opening weekend. Everybody's a contender. There's a lot cooking here in Columbus. We'll get to this big showdown. I want to thank Bubba Sparks for getting us ready. Oh, you yeah. can't have Bubba. a college football Saturday without a Bubba somewhere, oh, yeah. right? Nice. Good Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreet. Our sixth visit to Outside the Horseshoe begins our 10th season of College Game Day Road Shows. And thank God, it's been a long, <laughs> ugly yeah. off-season, but now football. everybody a little anxious, Listen. anticipation, opening day. Rennie, opening week is a perfect spot for double-digit underdogs to get upsets. The reason why, there's no preseason game, so people make a lot of mistakes. Aha! That equalizes the team. And number two, Kirk, and most important, the underdogs plan and scheme all summer, all spring for this one major upset, and they get them. Yep, and sometimes those heavy favorites look ahead to that exactly. big game next week. You're right, without preseason games, college coaches are really hand-tied here because think about breaking in so many inexperienced players. It's one thing to get it done in practice in two days, but you get in front of 80,000 people on national TV, you have no idea how they'll respond. Two games to watch today, USC's young quarterback at Auburn, how will he respond? And Georgia's offensive line, all five are making their first career starts going to Death Valley. Upsets will happen today because of the home field advantage. Hey, speaking of big games, this guy knows about him. Yes, we are delighted to welcome <laughs> Rocket Ismail to our yes, team here. We have upgraded you, our team you. speed significantly. No offense the to the scooter. Look at the wheels. The Heisman <laughs> runner-up back in 1990. <laughs> Nine-year career in the NFL. Welcome aboard, Rocket. Opening day. you got to love it. Man, this is awesome. Ohio State representing. <laughs> Indeed, this is going to be a big year for college football, and particularly a big year for big receivers. And Mike Williams is one of those from USC. I got a chance to holler at him this summer. We're going to be showing that piece later on in the show. Welcome aboard. I, I will you. say that Thank I think you. it might be a rookie mistake, though. Maize and blue outfit oh. here in Columbus. Oh. Hey, baby. All right. This is the, the ND represent on a DL. All right. <laughs> get a translation for you later, Lee. <laughs> the storylines today in college football include the fortunes of a fallen power. Now, that's a label that Florida State hates. But after nine losses in two years, there's new hunger from the Knowles. No longer an automatic pick in the ACC. Number one, Oklahoma is thinking shutout tonight, but Okie State and Nebraska collide. Who's going to emerge from this high stakes opener in Lincoln? Great game. And we'll weigh in on which big dogs of the SEC should be alert for the upset Lee talked about. A lot of matchups better than they sound. All of them better be on alert, as a matter of fact. The symbol of Ohio State's first national title in 35 years, from preseason number 12 to 14 0, half the wins by a touchdown or less. The Buckeyes last year had that magic. He's gone. Maurice Claret, touchdown. Picked off by Gamble. Chris Gamble, they go for the ball game. Touchdown. Let's party, Columbus. They are the national. 
national champions of college football. And now, for the first time in 11 years, a defending national champion opens against a ranked team. It's a Washington bunch with no fear of hostile road trips and a hunger to show a new toughness under a new head coach, Keith Gilbertson. Ohio State just as eager to hit the field tonight. They have the most talented scout team back in the world. Maurice Claret, maybe you've heard about his situation. He'll be in street close tonight for a minimum of three, perhaps as many as six games. Both these veteran teams must now prove they've handled summer sagas that cost one a head coach and the other a Heisman favorite. The older guys are real good at, uh, you know, just making sure that we're real focused, you know, and realizing, you know, we're there to help them, but also we got to take care of our business. You, you Like Coach Tress says, you're going you're to control what you can control, so do your job, do your role. You wish you, you could have said to him a little before, hey, you need to handle it maybe a certain different way, but uh, that's not his style. He's, he's a guy that's going to wear his heart on his sleeve, so it's, it's hard to change somebody like that. That's how good he is. I don't think anyone on this team has any resentment towards Maurice. Um, there's no doubt that, uh, that he, he is respected by all of us, and I have spoken with him a number of times, and you know, he's definitely you know, taken this whole situation to heart, and he's he just, he just hoping to, for a chance to get back and come back and prove that he's learned from his mistake. If this were a losing program, what's happened might be called a scandal, but I notice when it's a winning program, when you're winning big, it's called a distraction to overcome. Yeah. Now, they won without Claret last year, but it wasn't easy at times. What about this year? Well, I think it's a distraction in this case because it's a veteran football team. You've got to remember, this team won the national championship last year. They have 18 starters returning, 12 of which are seniors. So I think they look at this like, you know, we had faced adversity last year. We're going to be able to overcome it again this year. In their minds, they feel that way because of what happened last year. But with or without Maurice Claret, this team doesn't have the same defense that they had a year ago. When Claret comes back, when he's not in there, you will see Ohio State be more aggressive with the play calling starting tonight. Watched him throw the football now because they have an experienced quarterback in Craig Krenzel and great skill at wide receiver. With or without Claret, different play calling from Ohio State this year. Claret, Claret, Claret. I don't know about anybody else out there, but I'm tired about talking about a guy that's not even dressing tonight. You think? Forget about it. Let's get what the guys are going to win this football game. <laughs> if Ohio State wins this ball game, it's going to be offensive, running the football with that line, keeping the Washington on the heels, and then pass rush on picket. I think this ball game will be one up front, and that's where the Buckeyes have the advantage, especially if it's raining. You say more up front, you say more passive. Right. Right. Yeah, you yeah. You know, one guy who's an ex-Buckeye, played for Woody, is Randy Hart. He coaches the defensive line of Washington. He does not want to see his team embarrassed back in this no, play. He is desperate to show some new toughness. Yep. Rocket, what, what is your take on Claret? His, his talent is obvious, mm. but controversy always seems to kind of follow this guy. Let me tell you, when you're 19 years old, you're going to make mistakes. I did a lot of things that when I was 19, I'm not proud of. But the thing about me, I didn't have a national audience to scrutinize me. From this point, I believe Maurice will definitely learn a lot. He'll be able to move forward and make wiser and more mature decisions. It will not happen, though, for at least the NC State game, which is a, perhaps an even oh, tougher good. test in a couple weeks. By the way, last if any national champions to lose the opener, Michigan lost to Notre Dame. Ooh. I was going to say you're yeah, sorry yeah, for that gonna, game. Yeah, oh, yeah, but it's been a quarter that. century since the defending champs lost a home opener. That was Notre Dame losing. Like, sorry, I didn't mind that. Sorry. Well, at least you kept it <laughs> down. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have a lot more on this game. The gamble, picket, matchup, Washington moving on besides uh, Rick Neuheisel not being there. Also tonight, another Pac-10 contender opens on hostile turf at Auburn, a team with a lot of talent, but also a brutal schedule for those great expectations. Pete Carroll's Trojans, now they outquicked Auburn's road graders last year. They have dominated the offense in scrimmages. Tigers are trying to clear out a lane for all those running backs. Plenty of subplots in this one, including SEC Pride. That proud league was just 9-15 and 15 against other BCS conferences last year, so at least one Tiger considers this a regional pride thing. This defense that's coming in this Saturday, I'm, I mean, I know I'm not supposed to say it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. they have nothing on our defense. I mean, our defense is just great. We went over there last year, and um, we played, and we played to the best of our ability, and we came up short. Um, and ever since then, they've just been talking and, and making little comments and, and saying this and saying that about you know what I'm saying, the South in general. And I think it's time for uprising. I mean, I, I, I think that's just all what it all boils down to is pride. 
That's a good motivation. Yeah. I, I don't know which Trojan was slamming the <laughs> South. Pete Carroll has no I, idea what he's I, talking yeah, about right there. <laughs> New face is a big theme here. Tuberville will use a freshman punter and a freshman kicker to replace Damon Duvall. And, of course, Carson Palmer replaced by Matt Leinert. We'll talk more about that coming up. But there are plenty of proven guys in this game. Well, some Auburn fans think Auburn has so many running backs, all they're going to do is line up and pound it at USC and win. <laughs> Not so fast, my friends. <laughs> Look at this. An example, Carnell Williams last year. He had 97 yards in the first half, minus three in the second half. And here's an amazing stat. Auburn had, as a team, a total of 35 yards total offense in the second half. This USC can play defense with best teams in the country. They're going to be a tough game. Yeah, they were a great team last oh. year defensively. you got to believe that's going to continue this year. But now Auburn has depth at tailback, which will help them kind of spell Cadillac Williams with some of the other players like Ronnie Brown. But I think the key to this game is going to be Jason Campbell. His playmaking ability, scrambling, running option at times, and also the play-action pass with USC crowding the line with eight, sometimes nine guys at the line of scrimmage. Watch out for Courtney Taylor from Auburn. He's a redshirt freshman receiver maybe the best receiver they have on the roster 6'3 200 pounds and can fly Courtney Taylor and Jason Campbell in that passing game to kind of stretch that AFC defense and then you can get back to running the football and another new face Darnell Bing true uh, freshman starts at safety for How USC he so many athletes on defense there's some pressure on the quarterback we'll talk about Matt Liner coming up and uh, Rocket has his take on Mike Williams one of the 2,000 yard receivers for USC Plenty more coming up from Columbus. The Seminoles, not what they used to be, but that might be a good thing. A new and improved Florida State program. Or at least Bobby Bowden says so. Rick Neuheisel to the 2002 Huskies. They took him to a bowl game, but that was last year. Wait till you see what the former coach is up to now. And they are off this weekend, Rocket, but college game days on campus in Notre Dame. Coming up, a look under the dome of the Fighting Irish. We are going to get more turnovers than we ever got. One, two, three, three. College Game Day, built by the Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. And in part by Singular, the wireless company that fits you best. Coming up, Wisconsin and West Virginia. We'll talk about that game in Morgantown. The Badgers' high expectations in the Big Ten. And Alabama under Mike Shula, always high expectations. But beware the Bulls of South Florida. Meanwhile, in South Bend, headlines centering on a very combative start to the rape trial of Abram Elam, one of four ex-Notre Dame players charged in a rape incident in May 2002, alleged rape incident. Meanwhile, current Irish, they lose a backup quarterback and a reserve tight end, a pair of brothers in this week. Preparations for next Saturday's opener with Washington State continue as we go inside Notre Dame's 2003 season. We have to be focused. We have to, you know, learn from the mistakes we made last year. Uh, really concentrate during two days and uh, just go in with the mindset that, you know, we can't be beat and um, just try to execute on, on in every everything we do. <laughs> Why was it so important to come back to Notre Dame and finish things out here? Because I started here and, you know, I like to finish things, you know, that I start. And, uh, you know, plus it's, you know, I came here for a reason. I came here to graduate. And, uh, you know, I just didn't feel comfortable going somewhere else and, and not finishing what I started here. The game of football is one that guys are constantly moving in and out of lineups, but you go on. We have injuries, we have different things that forces your football team to adjust and move forward, and that's the game of football. Me and Chris are good friends. Uh, he, you know, I guess if that's what's best for him, then that's what's best for him. I didn't even get to really say goodbye to him. We had an orientation over the weekend, so I was pretty sad to not even really get to talk to him, and, uh, you know, I just wish him the best of luck. Tuesday, September 9th, debuts a weekly series inside Notre Dame football. As a concerned observer of the program, I want to ask you, what, what is your number one concern for this team entering this season? My number one concern is the offensive line. And the only reason is because they have four new starters. And the quicker they gel, I believe, the easier it's going to be for the Irish to have success. 
schedule's yeah. brutal. What, what's a successful season? To me, looking at their schedule, the successful season would be nine wins or more. Yeah. Not bad. You know, the yeah. Irish, they won 10 last year, and they beat four teams that finished in the AP top 10. They had a great season. But I agree, the offensive line, tough schedule. The Irish do not win nine, and they do not go to the BCS. I think their defense will keep them. I don't them, agree with Defense them. will keep them in every game they play. Their offense, 108th in the nation last year in total offense. They've got to improve, and I think Julius Jones coming in will help them with Ryan Grant, but I, I, I think with that schedule, it's going to be very, very difficult to get to nine wins. I, I think the BCS, they might fall short of that. Year two of the West Coast offense, they got to improve over 105. Julius Jones will they help will, They will improve. Yeah. We're excited to have a seasoned journalist, Ivan Mazel, the ESPN.com college football insider, join us this season for his Mazel's Minutes, which begins with a very anticipated debut in Blacksburg this weekend. The second Vic era at Virginia Tech has to wait for the end of the first Brian Randall era. Randall has been fantastic. Redshirt freshman Marcus Vic, number five, has speed and moves that will remind Hokies of number seven. But Randall, a second-year starter, is steadier. Coaches love steady. Minnesota coach Glenn Mason loves his backfield depth. Not only does he have quarterback Assad abdul Khalik and running backs Marion Barber and Terry Jackson, but freshman Lawrence Maroney has shown he's got cred as a runner, too. The rich get richer. Who starts at quarterback for Oregon? Junior Jason Fife? Beautiful throw by Jason Fife. Or sophomore Kellen Clements? The answer is yes. Coach Mike Bellotti has succeeded with in-and-out quarterbacks before, and he'll try it for at least two games. Both Fife and Clemens performed well this month. And we welcome Ivan Mazel aboard now from sticky and steamy Auburn. Ivan, there has to be a thick anticipation of that opening game against USC tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Chris. News on two job fronts. First, tailback here at Auburn. I spoke with running backs coach Eddie Grand late yesterday. He said that Cadillac Williams will start, and so will Ronnie Brown. Now, Grand's not concerned with how many touches they get. He just wants them both fresh late in the fourth quarter. He doesn't want to play anybody more than two series in a row. Also, quarterback at Florida, I spoke with both Ron Zook and offensive coordinator Ed Zonbrecher yesterday. They wouldn't spill the beans, but reading between the lines, it looks like it'll be Engel Martin to start, and talented freshman Chris Leak will play. Chris? Yeah, a former Florida coach once referred to a quarterback as a short pass hand it off kind of guy and that wasn't a good thing we'll see what the Gators have in quarterback this season later on I will have a look at a changed Bobby Bowden now it's August so of course it's it's obviously time to talk Heisman Trophy right a few months away we'll take a look at five superstars making their opening arguments for postseason hardware and that classic battle down south the Bulldogs and the Tigers mixing thing up in Death Valley but who's got the advantage downfield game day from Columbus coming right back Welcome back to Columbus. Always plenty of 45 jerseys here. Archie Griffin's old number. Not as many number 13 jerseys as you used to see. Of course, Ohio State, five Heismans with four guys. Archie, the only two-time winner. And Claret was considered one of the favorites for this year before his suspension. None of the top 10 vote-getters from a year ago for the Heisman are back. Eli Manning needs some help from his running game as he opens at Vandy. Eli Manning has the best offensive weapons he's ever had at Ole Miss. I think he gets Heisman numbers this year. Do you really? Yes, sir. He's going to get big numbers against Western Carolina. Phillip Rivers should have some big numbers against the Catamounts of Western Carolina. But what's going to make or break his cause games here against Ohio State, Florida State, Virginia, and Maryland. Tomorrow night, the Hokies open with Central Florida. Kevin Jones is the man now. Well, no more Lee sucks. Kevin Jones takes over one of the fastest players in all of college football. Because the Hokies win, he'll stay in the race, and he will put up some big numbers. Should be a candidate all year. Another team that plays tomorrow night, Texas, the debut for Roy Williams. Number four is the number one draft prospect. But the Horns are going to spread the ball around a lot to their weapons. I'm not sure he gets Heisman-type numbers. And there's one dark horse candidate out there. But if Missouri has a breakthrough year, beginning with a win over Illinois and St. Louis, Brad Smith, 1,000-1,000 man as a freshman, is going to be the reason. Now, Georgia lore is rich with history of the dogs hunkering down against adversity. There better be some hardcore hunkering down today at Clemson's Death Valley because the entire offensive line at Georgia is new. Two starting safeties are out. Two starting defensive linemen are out. Tony Milton is a capable running back, but he has no career touchdowns. Even Ugga is ailing. He needs off-season hind leg surgery. 
Wow. Meanwhile, wow. Clemson is hungry. They come off a 40-point bowl embarrassment. 15 and 14 in their last 29 games. They're picked in the second division of the ACC near the bottom of the conference. It's no secret that Tommy Bowden is feeling heat. He has the same record at this point in his career as Tommy West had, and that's not a good thing. Perfect spot for an upset. All those okay. reasons right there. Clemson has a wonderful shot at the Georgia Bulldogs because their quarterback, Charlie Whitehurst, can throw the football to the tallest best receivers in the ACC. Now watch Whitehurst number 21 as he throws the ball to an athlete named Derek Hamilton who's led the ACC in all purpose yards. Now he'll hit Kevin Youngblood, six foot five in the middle for a touchdown. But mark this down on your calendar. They got a red shirt freshman named Michael Collins who's six three receiver. He's gonna be a superstar. I think Clemson kicks a field goal at the end of the game and upsets the Georgia Bulldogs. Good pick, and I love those receivers of Clemson. Oh. Whitehurst is the guy to get him the football, but I think a big part of this season for Clemson is being able to run the ball. You realize last year, Tommy Bowden, for the first time as a head coach, the team did not go over 2,000 yards rushing. Starting tonight, that is a big factor. They've got to be able to run the football. Chris mentioned it. Georgia's got injuries all over their defense, and because of that, Look for Clemson to attack. They have a partial qualifier from a year ago named Dwayne Coleman. He's the guy that they feel can take him to the next level running the ball. We will see if he has that ability starting tonight. I'm with Lee. Defensive pressure on the young Georgia offensive line and Dwayne Coleman running for Clemson leads to an upset. I like the Tigers. You guys both we'll agree Clemson will win. Yes sir. yes, sir. That is a great cause of concern for the Clemson head coach. No way. You mean you both picked me? Y'all have never agreed on anything. Though, Coach Corso, you did pick me at Tulane to go undefeated in August. <laughs> Tom be able to just kind of laugh right. through the pressure, isn't he? That. That's right. He, don't want uh, the, he yeah. doesn't want the pressure. He yeah. doesn't, he'd rather have us pick Georgia, but yeah. I, I yeah, he's, both he's, of us. At home, big win. All Too right. many injuries for Georgia. Time for speed drills now. Let's look at the season and a sleeper team to get to a BCS bowl game. The LSU team. Why? Wonderful schedule at home. Remember the last time they played Tennessee for the SEC title? They beat them. Ah, I'm going with LSU. Well, they've got to get through their own division. I think Arizona State coming out of the Pac-10. I know everybody loves USC. Oregon State's improved. I think Arizona State, third year with Dirk Cutter. That's the team to keep an eye on in the Pac-10. Got four or five teams that could represent the Pac-10 in yeah. the BCS. All right, offensive player to keep an eye on today. North Carolina State versus Western Carolina, T.A. McClendon. I'll tell you what I think about T.A. McClendon. I think he was the best freshman running back in the nation last year, Ooh. including Maurice Claret. He's going to have 200 yards, all-purpose yards. I like Jason Campbell today. He has a lot to prove. Auburn's got a big game today against USC, and they need Campbell to step up and make some plays. He has a chance to show that he is the leader this year for the Tigers. You really know how to turn a crowd yeah, against he just, the guys. He's just waking them up. About it. The instincts never die. Defensive player to watch today. Texas has got a linebacker, Derek Johnson, 6 feet 12. Wonderful football <laughs> play. Plays New Mexico State today. He will run all the field. He'll be the best defensive player on the field. So let me get this straight. Derek Johnson is playing New Mexico State. Correct. That's, that's your player to watch. I, I, I'm going to go with the high-profile game. Chris Gamble in Ohio State. He'll be isolated at times, one-on-one -on -one against one of the best receivers in college football and Reggie Williams. That's the matchup to watch today in all of college football. Reggie Williams of Washington and Chris Gamble. That oh, will be, be great. That'll be, great, be great, great to see. You think those guys are both supremely confident in their talents? Uh, they, they wow, were talking players. a little trash in the Playboy All-American, too. There's a little bit of jaw in, so there's going to be it's gonna be settled today. Russell agrees. That matchup alone worth watching this game tonight. A lot of teams, a lot to lose. Alabama, Nebraska, and Colorado has a lot to lose. We'll see if the Buffs and Jeremy Bloom can avenge last year's bulldozing by the Rams in Denver. And from postseason, the new Hazelier, the Huskies make a new start. So do their former coach, but not where you might think. Welcome back to College Game Day, built by the Home Depot. Bradley Van Pelt leads CSU in an 84-yard game-winning drive against Colorado, then spikes the ball off a CU defender. The smack has happened. I have animosity towards him. I just, I'm one of those guys where, you know, they, they seem like their heads in the clouds, you know? I mean, they, uh, yeah, so they do have a tradition. I'll give them that. They, you know, they have a Heisman Trophy winner. They have, you know, this and that. And we, and we don't have those, and that's fine. But I think, you know, people, uh, I think people down there expect 
you know, to get respect from everyone just because they go to see you. Doesn't mean, to me, it means squat. You know, I've been to it. I think I've been to a big program. I've seen what it is, and, and I don't really care. I mean, we have guys in this team, 100 or so guys that can play football, that have heart, that have character, and that's something I think uh, they lack down there sometimes. Wow. When you win, you, you can jaw, I guess, but uh, they definitely have gotten CU's attention. I have not seen a Colorado team as motivated for CSU as they are tonight on the Broncos field, but there's a lot of reasons for that. They lost three out of four to the Rams, who are favored tonight, and also ranked ahead of Colorado, and also Gary Barnett is 0-4 in openers at Colorado. And oh, by the way, Marcus Houston, the disgruntled buff running back, transferred away to Colorado State and then got instant eligibility and there are more than a couple of Buffalo defenders who would like to say, hello, Houston, tonight. So, you know, a lot of motivation yeah. there, a lot of subplots in this game. Can we run Sonny Lubick's oh, response yeah. to his quarterback's uh, <laughs> comments there to Colorado? I'm sure that's interesting. And if the Colorado players are watching, guys, I, I don't know what to tell you. Poor old Colorado from the mighty Big 12. <laughs> lost three of the last four to Colorado State from the Mountain West Conference. And last year, guys, it flat out got embarrassing, not only with the spike and the trash talking from Bradley Van Pelt, but... How about Cecil Sapp? I think the Colorado defenders remember this run. We saw it on every highlight film. What did he go through, 15 defenders on his way into the end zone? And Van Pelt off Roderick Sneed, spike off the head. If Colorado has any guts, any oh. courage oh, at all, geez. step up and show what you can do. The quarterback from Colorado State just called the entire defense out. Are you going to respond? I think they will. I like Colorado to beat Colorado State. All you Colorado State guys are watching this show, don't listen to this guy. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going with Colorado State because of Sonny Lubick, your secret weapon. Won four of the last five ball games as an opener. Virginia, Michigan State, and Colorado twice is the teams he's beaten. And I got you, not so fast. You weren't even paying attention. Uh, Colorado State over Colorado tonight. Wow. All right, well, Joel oh, Klatt for CU, that. the quarterback debuts. He has no career completions, ex-Padres farmhand. Yeah. But concern, offensive line is, is a concern. They're going to be better than you think. The new kicker is a Real concern. Real quick, oh, forget big, X's big, and O's. Big, big heart. It's a rivalry game. Yeah, forget all Colorado the heart. Colorado State's got hey, heart. I know they, they do. Hard. By the way, Colorado comes in ranked number one in one category. Party school by the Princeton Review, up from number eight last year. Go. Never been prouder. Ohio State fans are disappointed. Where were we in there? <laughs> but the game here tonight, the Huskies are certainly hoping to build on the late road wins at Oregon and Washington State a year ago. They pull the upset, and UW can shed that soft label that has haunted them. It should, should set up a 4-0 start going to UCLA and would launch for Keith Gilbertson a great start to his season. He turned down an NFL gig, then got promoted, of course, when Rick Neuheisel got fired officially just a month ago. So the Huskies have had to ride out their own weird summer saga. None of us wanted that to happen. None of us felt good about it. Everybody felt bad for Rick and his family. I know we lost our head coach, who was a great guy, but, you know, I mean, we still have our offensive coordinator, our former offensive coordinator as a head coach. If anybody had to take over, it had to be Coach Gilbertson, uh, especially for me. He's the guy I work with every day for, ever since I've been here. Been my offensive coordinator, so I'm very comfortable with him, as well as our whole team is, and uh, we're excited and ready to play. Meanwhile, while Neuheisel's legal team plots its options, including possible legal action, the Huskies' ex-boss is back in coaching. He's tutoring the quarterbacks at Rainier Beach High School in Seattle. You know, the first opponent, by the way, canceled their game against his team, not because of Neuheisel, just they didn't have enough players, the coach said. Privately, it is killing Neuheisel not to be here with this team tonight. He thinks they can have a great season. He declined to talk to us this week, but as Reese Davis reports, Neuheisel seems to be enjoying his fresh start and his modest surroundings. Once again, just living that absolute charmed life. I've made an initial determination to terminate Rick Neuheisel's employment as a head football coach at the University of Washington. The howl of Husky Stadium is a far cry from Rainier Beach, located just southeast of downtown Seattle. Home of the Vikings and, for now, home to a high-profile quarterback's coach, Rick Neuheisel. People ask... Uh, why and because coaching's coaching and it's what I do in the falls and uh, I'm very thankful to the coaching staff here for allowing me to be part of it. When he talked to me on the phone he told me he wanted to get back to the hands-on coaching business actually getting in there and down in the trenches and actually doing some coaching. He could have stayed home and he chose not to 
he's you know he's he's coming here and he's helping us because you know he's a great guy i hope to be valuable in some respect but uh, i told him there's nothing i can do that will even come close to doing what you're doing for me which is giving me an opportunity the former washington and colorado head coach wasted little time making a mark on his new high school team he's responsible for quarterbacks you know all the mechanics all the little detail work of the quarterbacks and make sure they get the right reads and all that stuff that's that's his job oh he had to slow him down a little bit he's you know he was gung-ho and wanted to add all the little wrinkles and stuff too soon i said just slow down a little taste it's gonna take these guys a little longer to pick it up this is pure this is what it's supposed to be it's football and it's the young people wanting to uh, be better people both as i said on and off the field we told them it's just a family we're a family here we're gonna watch each other's back and take care of our house here if we take care of our house here, everything on the outside doesn't matter Husky fans hoping it'll be no problem under Keith Gilbertson. New Hansel, by the way, I'm told after a few practices, knew the name of all of his players at Rainier Beach High School. That's pretty good. That's a skill. Now, regardless of what you think of Rick Neuheisel or his errors in judgment, because he's made a couple, or how he handles situations, think about this. Termination for entering an NCAA basketball pool, I don't care what the entry fee is. You gotta be kidding. I mean, does that strike you as a grievous, fireable offense? I mean, the NCAA's take on basketball pools is a little bit hypocritical when you consider that the tournament is a cash cow for the organization, the only one they've really got, and yet a huge part of the NCAA basketball's popularity, and that cash cow comes from basketball pools, player drafts, things like that. So let's lighten up. Good job. Right. Very, very good job. And I don't know all the facts why Rick Newhouse is not coaching college football now, but I do have a couple of recommendations for Rick. First of all, I think he needs to correct some of his youthful mistakes he's made along his coaching career. And I think one of the ways to do that is to keep quiet, let everything settle down, and quit taking attention to himself. And then, if he does correct those mistakes, and I think he will, I, in a heartbeat, would hire that guy as a new football coach because I think the new, mature Rick Neuheisel would be good for college football. I think the guy's a good man. Well, when he was in there, when he was a head coach, yeah. he related to the college players today as well as any head coach in college football. I think the thing that has hurt him more than anything is being associated to all the other problems and scandals in the offseason with other coaches. It's like we just kind of lump them all together, and that has hurt, I think, the image of Rick Neuheisel. Time will take care of that, and I'm with Lee. Next year, the year after that, he will land on his feet. As far as Washington tonight, you heard Cody Pickett, their quarterback, touch on it. I still have my same offensive coordinator. It's the same defensive coordinator. The chemistry will still be there. They're going to miss Rick and his personality, mixing in with the players, but the players are resilient. They'll put this behind them. They'll look forward to playing a football game tonight, and Keith Gilbertson has experience as a head coach, which is a big factor in preparing the Huskies for this season. I agree with that. I'm not so convinced that he bounces right back into I coaching new I It's wrong to lump together all yes. these coaches. What they did is very different in each Isolated. case, but... I'm going to bring Ivan here because I think the climate is very gun sham among the presidents. Ivan, what do you think about how soon will Newhouse will get back? I don't think he gets back anytime soon, Chris. You know, he, I, I wish he would, but the last thing presidents want is controversy. And if you can think of an introductory press conference where all they're going to do is have to defend the hire they just made, that's not good. No, the school's going to have to be willing to ride that out. Right? That, they'll have to ride that out, and that'll last until he, maybe a month. I mean, once you hire him and he says the right things at the press conference and deals with it, puts it behind him, the guy deserves a second chance. Rick Neuheisel should be a college football coach. He deserves Forget a second NFL. chance. Forget, Forget the it, NFL. NFL. Hey, speaking college. of controversy, Mike Price's sons, are they're going to be at the game wow. tonight, the ultimate road trip. They're yeah. going around the country. His former assistants, Price, of course, gone at Alabama, and Mike Shula is in. Can the man with the legendary coaching name bring the Crimson Tide? to prominence and two teams with tough seasons in 2002 the Gators and Volunteers both need a winning start to bounce back a preview of those big SEC games coming up glad you've joined us for the debut of our 10th season of college game day on the road November 93 number two Notre Dame upset number one Florida State and South Bend it all began there we will be in Tuscaloosa next week if the Crimson Tide dodged the upset of South Florida. The Bulls were 9-2 and two last year. They did get embarrassed early at Arkansas. Obviously, this would be the biggest win ever for the program. It would also be a disaster for Mike Shula in his debut. Oklahoma coming in next. The Tide's third coach in nine months, second youngest coach in Division 1A. No previous head coaching experience, but he did have more touchdown passes than Namath or Stabler when his career in the mid-'80s wrapped up.
you learn in a hurry when you first get here, whether or not it's as a coach or as a player about the tradition and how special um, this place is. And since I've been back, actually, now it feels a little bit like a time warp. It feels like, you know, being back here on campus that uh, almost those 15 years, that where'd they go? I was here as a student, now I'm kind of, st I'm back here again. I think the only thing that feels different uh, is now I'm living off campus <laughs> for the first time. Well, time warp is what the Bama fans would like to do. Yeah. It's, it's been a Rocky Horror show in the offseason. It's know, a movie Mike, reference for you. <laughs> right. Twice. Just, it's a little over my head. Right. Godfather's my style. <laughs> Let me tell you, Mike Shula has had wonderful experience, all with one exception. He's never been a head football coach at any level. And I know, as a former football coach, I'm interested to see how he reacts during the game if adversity hits the tied football team. And I know, Kirk, from personal experience, that's the one thing you can't teach, you can't read, and it'll make a difference who your father is. That's a tough situation. I think the Tide wins today, but much, closer. much closer than the experts think. Well, you're right about this football game. Bama needs to watch out. There's so much anticipation about Oklahoma coming to Tuscaloosa that the players need to show up ready to go, especially on the offensive side of the ball. USF plays outstanding defense. Brody Croyle's going to take over. We're going to see what he can do with this offense. They're keeping it hidden behind closed doors. What's going to happen with this year's offense? But you know it's going to include Sean Williams, who's one of the better backs in the SEC. He had a, over 1,600 yards of all-purpose. Now, I was in Tuscaloosa a couple weeks ago. There's so much focus on Mike Price and, of course, now with Mike Shula. But when you talk to the Alabama players, that's the one thing that's consistent. I know they're still on probation. They can't go to a bowl game. Can't win an SEC title. New coach. But when you talk to the players, I believe in what I'm seeing there. And I think this team can win eight games, which would be amazing. Starting today, if they show up ready to go, Bama beats USFF. USF, what are we supposed to call them? USF. They want to be called USF. Call them South Beats Florida. USF. <laughs> and I think they have a good season. I think Mike Shula is going to do a good job this year. Yeah, USF is the San Francisco Dons, unless yeah, you're from Tampa. Right, just right. just get over it. That's yeah. the Bill Cartwright and Bill Russell. By the way, there's a little subplot for Shula's debut. Jim Levitt, the Bulls coach, yes. was one of those candidates for the Alabama job when they hired Mike Price. So you don't want to lose to him. No. Let's talk about other teams in the SEC that might want to be on upset alert. They look like convincing winners, except Florida takes on a San Jose State team that does come off a shutout. I know it was Grambling, but it's a good 1AA program, and they're so young, the Gators. 47 of 85 scholarship players have never taken a snap, including Chris Leak. Forget about it. The Gators are in the swamp, right? Offense, defense, kicking game. They win big over San Jose. Big. Yes, sir, big. Okay. And surprise everybody. Well, I think the big thing is going to be how will the quarterback situation handle themselves, and they're breaking in so many new starters yeah. on defense. I think it's going to be closer than people think. That's one to watch. Tennessee, a big favorite. Fresno State will not have starting quarterback Paul Pinniger. He has a pectoral muscle. Jeff Grady has some experience there. The first test of whether Tennessee has the new dedication and they mean business. Well, they talk about toughness in the offseason and, and being a team that's going to come together as one. Last year, that was not there. I think Tennessee playing at home has something to prove, and I think they'll make a statement today. They'll win big. Long passes, long returns, long runs. Tennessee is back. They're a good football yeah, team good. now. The only other time Fresno State played an SEC team, they played Auburn. Remember that game? Yeah, I picked all. You picked, you you picked, picked Fresno, Fresno State, oh, and they lost 62 nothing. That was not an upset alert. That's right. We'll talk about <laughs> the big right. boys in the Big Ten kicking off this weekend. Which one of them faces a real danger of an early upset? And Bobby Bowden's Knowles have had their share of off-field problems, but Florida State, they found a way to right the wrongs. We just put all our off-field troubles behind us, and everybody just want to play. So we don't care about whatever goes on outside that field. Folks in Columbus won't mind if we shift the focus to the Big Ten. In East Lansing, debut of John L. Smith and the return of quarterback Jeff Smoker, who's dealt with his substance abuse problem. I realize that it is only going to be temporary. You know, I've had it taken away from me. And uh, you know what, I've made it through that point, so I realize that I can live without football. But I sure do enjoy playing it, and I'm going to be back. The bad news, Charles Rogers is gone. Western Michigan, kind of a middle of the MAC team. Yeah, but I'm proud of John L. Smith, the coach, giving Jeff Smoker a second chance. Smoker smokes Western Michigan big. This guy can play, and I'm proud of John L. 
giving him a second. Did he have a choice given the other quarterbacks around there? <laughs> I'm not sure. Central Michigan takes on Michigan. Michigan 16-0 against the current MAC. They're, they're promising more passing in Ann Arbor. There. Well, it's funny. John Navarre has gone from being the, the scapegoat to now being the fan favorite. 236 yards a game the last five to end the year. Braylon Edwards will be wearing jersey number one. He's got a lot of weapons to work with. I think he puts up some big numbers. I think the Wolverines roll today in their opener. Yeah, not in that game, but in other games, you have to beware the Mac. Northern Illinois, that Thursday night home field upset of Maryland. That's the first win over a ranked team in four years. But there is a history here, including mighty Miami of Ohio, which visits Iowa today. And I'm going to put the Hawkeyes on upset alert. I mean, they're not a huge favorite here, but they have a lot of new faces. And... Ben Roethlisberger of Miami, Ohio, very, very talented quarterback. Yeah, but Iowa's won eight of the last ten openers. They got that kicker, Nate Keating. I think Iowa wins a close game with Nate Keating kicking a lot of field goals. Well, Roethlisberger can throw it all over the place. The problem is, can the Red Hawks play the defense that they need to play to stop Iowa at home? I think Fred Russell will have the big game today for the Hawkeyes. You, have, you question the Miami, Ohio's defense. Yes, I right. do. Yep. Wisconsin, meanwhile, they fully expect to be in the Rose Bowl race despite the fact, and do you realize this, they've won a grand total of nine Big Ten games the last three seasons. Now, Barry Alvarez told us last night he's never had a defense as quick and athletic as this one right here. Anthony Davis, 1,700-yard games. Jim Sorgi is a proven passer. He has weapons all over the place. The focus today, the return of 2001 All-American receiver, Lee Evans. That game follows us on College Game Day, and Mark Jones and Bob Davey now set the scene. Guys? Ambitions and expectations flowing freely, highly on the banks of the Monongahela River here in Morgantown, West Virginia. West Virginia taking on Wisconsin. Some of their fans have made the trip from Madison to watch their crew play. As for Lee Evans, he is on the verge, on the cusp of authoring one of the great comeback stories in all of college football this year. He hasn't played since November 2001. Mark Jones along with Bob Davey. Glad you're coming aboard. Lee Evans, so talented, but so many questions about this comeback. Mark, it's been a long road back for Lee Evans. Anyone that's had major knee surgery knows that. In 2001, Lee Evans had 75 catches for over 1,500 yards. At the end of that season, Wisconsin coaches said he's the best in school history, a sure first-round draft choice. Missed all the last season, had a second knee surgery. We'll find out today if Lee Evans is all the way back. For Wisconsin, one player that never left, tailback Anthony Davis has rushed for over 3,000 yards the last two seasons, more than any back in college football. Mark, he is not only fast, but 198 pounds, he is powerful. On the other side of the ball, Rashid Marshall, quarterback for West Virginia, and Quincy Wilson looking to assume a greater leadership role offensively because of some key losses. They're up to the task. The Badgers, the Mountaineers coming up. Back to the studio. Should be fun. You know, Alvarez elected not to have Lee Evans hit at all in practice. So you know West Virginia ZBs are going to go right after him. Welcome him back to college football. They will. And that's the big test today for Lee Evans. You think about West Virginia's defense. This is a young team up front. They're going to put eight or nine guys up. They're going to have to to try to stop Anthony Davis in a running game, which should open things up for this newfound Wisconsin passing attack with Jim Sorge and company. Uh, Sorge's known for his throwing ability. Five starts as a Badger. Only had one touchdown pass last year. He needs to take command of this offense beginning to Today. There's a look at a couple of his younger wide receivers now with the addition of Lee Evans coming back assuming he is 100% in healthy which they say he is ready to go you throw Brandon Williams Jonathan Orr, Barry Alvarez told me this is the deepest and most athletic wide receiving core that he's ever had in Madison I think the balance of their offense is the difference I like Wisconsin today in West Virginia well West Virginia lost all their frontline defenders bad news <laughs> they lost their linebackers Bad news. They lost all their top tacklers. Bad news. Good news. Anthony Davis gets over 200 yards rushing, but Wisconsin wins a close one. I'm close. This could be a tough ball game, but they'll run the ball and win this one. He goes for 200, yet it's close? Exactly. They're not going to be close Watch if he runs for, for 200. Again. All right. All right. Now, now to ex-West Virginia head coach Bobby Bowden. The Seminoles' 73-year-old boss is showing a new side these days. Feisty and crusty. The loss of protege Mark Rick in the Sugar Bowl just led to an even uglier offseason. In April, Bobby's oldest son pled guilty in a scheme that swindled millions from various investors, including $1.6 million from Bobby Bowden himself. This summer, he was forced to testify in the gambling trial of ex-quarterback Adrian McPherson, which ended in a hung jury. McPherson later pled guilty. So, tonight's long-awaited opener in North Carolina, will that improve Bobby Bowden's mood? 
with nine losses in two years. These have been trying times on the field as well. Here's Jeremy Schaap with the Seminoles. an attitude I think that we had when we hit the field it was like we knew we were going to win it's just a matter of how bad we were going to beat you. We're Florida State you know it's like we don't have that same swagger no more it's like we're trying to get our swagger back. The swaggering gunslinging Florida State Seminoles who dominated college football for a generation are no more just ask the alumni. I think they have a lot less to swagger about these days, and and, and uh, they have to gain their confidence back. The last two years were kind of like a down, you know, because everybody that left here, you know, look back on us like, man, what's what's going on with those guys? You y'all guys don't got to fight no more. Y'all lost their image, you know. Nobody's scared to come in Duke Campbell no more. Nobody's scared of that spill on the helmet no more. In the last two seasons, the Seminoles have lost nine games, more than in any other two-year span under Coach Bobby Bowden. At the same time, prominent players such as Peter Warwick, Lavernius Cole, Sebastian Janikowski, and Adrian McPherson have embarrassed the program off the field. Does any of this to you smack of a lack of institutional control? I don't think there's any lack of institutional control. It's, it's you know, just the opposite. In each case, um, there were several different issues that have evolved. The institution's the one that reported them. The institution's the one uh, that initiated the uh, litigation, the reviews, the whatever it is that happened. A former speaker of Florida's House of Representatives, T.K. Weatherall, has been FSU's president since January. Forty years ago, when Weatherall was a seminal wide receiver, his position coach was Bobby Bowden. What does he mean to this university? Bobby Bowden's an institution. I mean, uh, when I was growing up in, in college football, it was Bear Bryant. Today, it's Bobby Bowden and Joe Paterno. If you walk around the institution and you look, uh, the university center, 90% of what's there is academic. That's uh, as a result of uh, FSU athletics and Bobby Bowden. As the scandals and losses have mounted, even Bowden's future at the university has become an issue. Will he stand his ground and try to restore the Seminoles' dynasty, or will he retire before all that he's built crumbles? Bob Bowden is losing it. It's just that problems that's been occurring, you know what I'm saying? Injuries, um, the years that people coming in, you know, freshman quarterback, young running back, young offensive line, and experienced cornerback, you know, it's just... Everything comes in, it puts a lot of pressure on him to get certain things ready and also worry about people outside of field. He taught me, it isn't how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. Bobby Bowden will get up, and he'll do it right, and uh, that's the way it is. But the question, once unthinkable, is now being posed. Will Bowden be pushed into retirement? Have you ever thought about that possibility? Dismissing Bobby Bowden? No. <laughs> Bobby will put more pressure on himself than this university will put on him. When it's time for Bobby to step down, he'll know it before any of the rest of us know it. Ivan Maisel rejoins us now. Folks, uh, don't even recognize this Bobby Bowden these days, Ivan. Chris, make no mistake, there's no more Mr. Nice Guy. Bobby has been curt with the media. He's closed the locker room for the first time in 28 years, and there's two reasons. One, he didn't like being told he'd lost control of the program after the McPherson debacle, and he really didn't like how his son Steve was treated in the media after the investment scandal. Lee, we've all heard about how mean the Seminole defense is going to be this year. I think they're just taking a cue from their coach. Yeah, I mean, I, you've talked about some changes that uh, Bobby has made. I agree with some but I disagree with one of them. First of all, I think Bobby's done the right thing by coming off the tower during practice and getting closer to the football team. I think he did a terrific thing by hiring linebacker coach Kevin Steele. That'll help his defense. And last but not least, he's watching more tapes and he's involved in the planning of his football team. I disagree with Bobby changing any of his policies personally or to the team for media relations. Changing that policy, Kirk, is not going to help his players not stay out of trouble or help him win more ball games. I think he should be good old Bobby again because he's more comfortable doing that. The Knolls are back. They'll win on defense tonight against North Carolina. I think the reason he's doing it is the reason you know he's fed up. I think he's just fed up with continuing to have to defend himself and his program. I think his players are fed up. But for this Florida State team this year to get back to competing for a national title, 
with all due respect to Bobby Bowden, it comes down to the ability of Chris Ricks to make plays. Starting tonight against North Carolina, Chris Ricks needs to get off to a good start, not only to get his own confidence back, but to get his teammates to start to believe in him again. That was something that, regardless of what happened at the end of last year, he never quite mixed with the players. And that's something to keep an eye on with this year. They're saying all the right things leading up to this game, but watching him and his development this year starting tonight will be key. But I think this is an upset football team. Their defense tonight will make a statement. I like Florida State big with defense, and Rick's playing well. Well, they're not going to be tested by North Carolina's offense. No. I don't know how much we're going to learn about that defense, but Darnell Dockett's going to stand up in front of the team, and Bowden said, you've got to address yeah. this team. You've got to become a leader. It's time for him to get paid, all right? This is a career year Contract. for a talented guy like Dockett. you got Kendall Pope and Michael Bulwer. they got plenty of talent. That's a very good defense. But we're going to not learn much about him this game tonight, though. The Buckeyes, of course, remember they won it all last year? The Sooners start this year as the nation's top team. Will Oklahoma feel the weight of number one? And the Cowboys pulled off an upset last year in Nebraska. Can they do it again? This time, however, in Lincoln, where they've lost 18 in a row. We're coming back. This is College Game Day, built by the Home Depot. You talk about a high-stakes opener. Nebraska hosts Oklahoma State, a hyped team with a high-octane offense, and the Huskers drag in a lot of bad baggage. Three-game losing streak. Seven straight losses to ranked teams, six of those by two touchdowns or more. Another 7-7 seven and seven season is going to be last call for some folks, and they know it. In the all-time case of calling out a bunch of current players, 800 Former Nebraska players will march into memorials. Have you ever heard of that? 800? 800. Are you kidding me? Uh -oh. Trying to send a message. Uh -oh. Nebraska has a bunch of famous fans, but the hottest athlete on the planet right now that's a Nebraska fan is Andy Roddick, and he's looking for a big bounce back here. I had a little bit of an off year uh, last year, but you know I think a lot of it has to do with uh, team chemistry. Maybe, who knows, they're, they're going to click this year. I don't think anybody's expecting much of them this year, so uh, you know, maybe, maybe that'll work in their favor. I definitely catch a little more flack, because when they're doing well, I definitely talk a lot. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's tough, but hopefully they'll, they'll rebound this year. I reminded him of the Colorado scores. Anthony, Andy, great match last night. Moving on to the third round. <laughs> Happy birthday, Andy. You know, Nebraska has rolled over Oklahoma State 18 straight times, but that was under Tom Osborne. Yeah. They have a lot of streaks against Tom Osborne. New staff, anticipation, little anxiety for this game? Well, I think it should no, be. I, it should be because I think Nebraska's current decline started with two huge losses a couple of years ago to Colorado and Miami back-to-back. -back. What happened then? First of all, the talent level was down because they got... Recruit, poor recruiting by a tired staff. Number two, the Nebraska players lost their swagger, lost their confidence, and they believe what the media said. They weren't any good anymore. They've been 7-7. Seven and seven. I think they're back. I think Solich made some good moves on his staff. New enthusiasm there. I like Nebraska this year to have a good team. They'll beat Oklahoma State. Our boy goes to Wimbledon, and he brings Andy Roddick into yeah, the show. Yeah, he's doing it. Good guy. Uh, I, I guess so. I will get maybe something like that every week. I, I, gets. Oklahoma State has a three-headed monster on offense. They have Josh Fields who can throw the football, Tatum Bell who can run, and, of course, Rashawn Woods at wide receiver. So Nebraska, it's pretty simple. You have to take away the running game first and foremost, and you're going to see a new defensive scheme unveiled today for the Black Shirts. Sure, they're going to attack. They're going to be aggressive, but they're not going to leave their corners out on an island the way they have for the last three or four years you'll see more zone to protect against woods but i'm with these guys i think the attitude is there 800 alumni coming back on the field nebraska's defense big today i like them play well tonight nebraska beats oklahoma state that boat Pelini system is kind of like an oklahoma system it's That's it's good. a kind of a distant cousin of what they do at Oklahoma. Because didn't that. Oklahoma State and Rashawn Woods torch that Oklahoma yes, system? Well, that's just in case. Okay. Josh Field's not afraid of zone. No, no, no. no. you got to take away the running game first. That's what Speaking of Oklahoma, with. they take on the mean green of North Texas, who's just going to wow. make a lot of mean green for the game for showing up. And it's throwback <laughs> jersey day in Norman. Now, these are the, the jerseys they're going to wear. Not a lot different. They don't have the Oklahoma name on top of the number. they got some stripes here. I, oh. I don't know. I don't know. Was a makeover needed? I mean, did the queer eye... For the straight guy guys show up in Norman and say, we need new jerseys? <laughs> I don't, it's just for this game. It is just but for I, this game. they got the Aggie stripes there on, this, on the arms. Same oh. old, Sooner defense, though. They're expecting a shutout in this yeah, game. Yeah, I, I, I think same defense, no problems. Oklahoma's going to roll. Jason White, though, comes back. Let's see how he plays. Yeah, Oklahoma, story Oklahoma wins this ball game, and they do not allow a touchdown. Their no defense. Right, right. No touchdowns. Buckeyes, the heart of the running game from last year is on the practice squad. Does the receiving core have the hands to pick up the slack? 
And speaking of sure hands, USC's number one has a tight grasp on how to play catch. Coming up, Rocket joins Mike Williams. He turned him, beat him, and then Slant came inside, and he was all he was, he was in chase mode. I mean, he was pretty much beat. Our 10 seasons of game day on the road have featured five previous visits to Columbus. The Buckeyes record in those games, 5-0. and oh. Now back to tonight's top 10 collision. We talked Auburn earlier. SC breaks in Heisman Trophy winner Carson Palmer's replacement. He's Matt Leinert, 6'5", redshirt sophomore lefty. He is surrounded by talent, including his pro surfer model girlfriend. Can he be a steady enough distributor? Pete Carroll, Norm Chow, they are very, very eager to find out if he can be an accurate passer. And guys, it's going to be very, very tough to contain Kerry Colbert and Mike Williams, USC's great pair of wide receivers. Well, Kerry Colbert is the anchor, but Mike Williams last year had an unbelievable freshman year. You go back to last year, Rocket, he had a, he had a four-year starting quarterback in Carson Palmer. How much do you think having Palmer there just, just kind of helped him with his development? Man, let me tell you something. To have a veteran quarterback is key. When I was a freshman, my first college game, I was terrible, bootleg. <laughs> the only thing that saved me was the fact that Tony Rice brought me in and said, hey, be o it's going to be okay. Sure, gave me confidence. Mike Williams got off to a rough start last year in his first game, but now he's one of the best receivers in college football. I got a chance to visit with him and talk to him about making the big catch. Five, four, three. Okay, we just called the play in the huddle. Do you survey the defense? Because Are you looking for anything special for this particular play? Uh, you want to come out the huddle. You want to find where the nearest safety is, your nearest backer, line up to your cornerback, find his eye level so he can't get a quick jam, or a good position on you if he tries to bump, and then get ready for the quarterback's cadence. Red 25, shut up! Going to the corner, he's wide open. Mike Williams, touchdown! So on this particular pattern, explain to us, okay, now I'm at the line. He's, right. if he's bumped, this is what I'm gonna do. If he's off, this is what I'm gonna do. If he's shaded outside, just kind of go through that process. DBs play with weight. They're gonna have the weight forward. They're gonna have a little rock. The knee's gonna be slightly bent inside. So I'm gonna look for that. And if that's the case, then I'm gonna, since I'm such a bigger, I'm a bigger guy, right. when I give him top of the shoulder pad, right. I'm gonna get this elbow, okay. and throw him, and slap through on his back to turn him, then I'm gonna shoulder dip and inside release into my route. Okay, with that technique you just described to me, were there any games from last year that you remember using that technique? Uh, there was an Oregon game. We had a third and seven, All right. and he showed that his leverage was forward, that he was gonna press jam me. Uh -huh. I stepped lateral, uh -huh. so he had to open up his hips. Okay. Then I slapped here and turned him, beat him. He was in chase mode. I mean, he was pretty much beat. Now, after you make your release, your mindset in the actual route, and what's going through your mind there? All right, well, after I make the release, mm -hmm. I'm gonna beat him, slap him aside. The first thing I wanna do, since he's in pursuit, I wanna get my body up the field to create more distance. And so he has to do that, work that much harder to get back to me, much less to the ball, so he can't make the play on the ball. You know, you get out of your break, you turn to a running back, you gotta explode on the first step. You know, the first guy's not gonna make the tackle. If you're gonna get tackled, you, you deliver the hit, you don't receive the hit. You don't have the pursuit, you know, you kinda leave this hand free. Right. Stiff arm, you know, and find the end zone. Deep down the middle, touchdown! Williams breaks free, touchdown USC! Touchdown Mike Williams! Like that, he's gone. Boy, really a mature young man. It's his second year. What do, you, what do you think? He doesn't have Palmer there anymore. Second year, now the anticipation's up. What will be his biggest challenge, you think, in the second year? I think the biggest challenge for Mike Williams is going to be getting the same synergy that he had with Carson and trying to get that with Leinhardt. And that's going to be a tough thing to do down in Auburn today. I, I think you think about Matt Leiner trying to break in his first game as a starter against Auburn. I, I think you're right. I think the key, not only for the season, let's start tonight against Auburn is Matt Leiner, his development as a quarterback. And, boy, tough way to break in. You're talking about maybe the best pass rush in the SEC. Reg, watch this. Now, Reggie Torber is going to bring wow. speed from the outside. There's Carlos Dansby. He might be the best outside linebacker in college football. Torber again. And here they both come. If Matt Leiner's watching this, he's probably thinking, I don't know if I want to necessarily play and Lee I, I think this is going to be the key how does Matt Leiner deal with 
the heat, the humidity, the crowd noise, that's going to be a big factor. And that's the reason home field advantage, I think, wins this game for Auburn. I like Auburn to get it done with defense and Jason Campbell's ability to throw. Pick, Kirk. I tell you, that's a terrific pick. But let me give you another side of the ball. USC last year shut down the Auburn great rushing attack. So watch the Auburn staff to add a new wrinkle, the running of quarterback Jason Campbell tonight. Now, Jason, number 17, gets out of the spread formation, but he's really running the football on a quarterback draw. But here's what I like about him the most. Inside the red zone, he's 6 feet 4, 233 pounds. He can run and score, but he can also throw the short passes. I agree with Kirk. I think it's great defense, home field, Auburn in a close ball game. But this could be one of the best defensive games the entire year. Auburn, USC. I agree. USC, not huge up front, but they call them the Wild Bunch, <laughs> too, that defensive line. 1969 was the original Wild Bunch. Is that right? A.C. Cowlings. Wow. Remember that name? He was part of that, an All-American. USC's defense, not on the field very much last year because they led the nation in time of possession. If the offense can't do that again, it puts a lot more pressure on the USC defense, but I agree. Great game tonight. Great game. Tonight. Well, as you know by now, there is no Mo in Ohio for now, so can the rest of the Buckeyes' offense find a way to shine with that Florette? Or on Chris Gamble in the showdown of the horseshoe tonight when we come back to Columbus. On Campus is presented by Outback Steakhouse. No rules, just right. Buckeye fans have certainly not turned their back on Maurice Corrette. Number 13 is wearing number 24 as a scout team tailback. California governor, they want Maurice to challenge Arnold and Gary Coleman. 24, of course, is Washington's running back, Rich Alexis. There's some focus on him tonight as well. But certainly, Claret has the kind of difference-making talent and charisma that just magnifies everything he does on and off the field. Picking up the slack and the carries, a pair of highly recruited backs who are eager to make their mark. Neither one as big or as shifty as Claret, but Maurice Hall and Lydell Ross, who has a career average of five yards a carry, are solid. And as Shelly Smith reports, so is the Buckeyes' confidence. The Ohio State Buckeyes believe the hole created in their offense by the loss of Maurice Claret isn't as big as the holes they created for him to run through last season. Oh, what a freshman sensation number 13 is. Claret missed the better part of four games in 2002 because of injury. Ohio State won all four, and the two backs who replaced Claret, Lydell Ross and Maurice Hall, combined for 124 yards per game. As a team and as a coaching staff, we have a tremendous amount of confidence in those two to go out and do what we want them to do. It's not like you're going to go without that position. You know, we we had a number of games last year that it wasn't always Maurice Claret, you know, dot in the eye. It's not like Prince is going to look back to see if who's back there and run a certain play. So it's just the system that we have. You know, we know guys can, can get the job done. When Claret didn't play, Ohio State averaged 40 fewer rushing yards per game. Total offense averaged 100 fewer yards per game. In order to win, the Buckeyes had to rely on timely playmaking. Last season, the Buckeyes' run-to-pass ratio was virtually the same with and without Claret, slightly more than two runs for each pass. But even with Claret, Ohio State was hoping to diversify their offense this season to better utilize receivers Michael Jenkins and Chris Campbell. For last year, we were a big running team. Um, we tried to make some big plays in the passing game and pretty much just not turn the ball over. This year, we'd like to add that passing game and, and mix it in with the running game, become more balanced to help us move the ball. We would like to be able to attack deep. If you don't attack deep, they're going to sit on you. And you're having to throw the ball more with Maurice Claret out. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily what's going to happen. I think we want to throw the ball a little bit more this year just to become a more balanced attack and, and uh, be able to utilize our weapons better. But we're developing a new identity. It's, it's the whole it's, you know, it follows that same trend of you've got a new year, a new team, and you've got a whole new set of a whole new environment to work with. We're not a team with just one weapon. But every fan here is waiting to see what the impact will <laughs> yeah. be emotionally in that game. Yep. Washington, meanwhile, they had the worst rushing offense in school oh, history man. last year, about two yards a carry. So it's it's much bigger problem to say if no. they lost Cody Pickett Absolutely. and the Buckeyes without Claret. If poor old Washington has any chance against the mighty Buckeyes tonight, they got one chance. Cody Pickett throwing it and Reggie Williams catching it.
Number three, Pickett, moves around, and watch him hit number one, Williams. That guy can run. But now this is my favorite. Watch Pickett hit Williams underneath coverage, and he runs and flies. Now, I said it. It's a big if. But if the poor old Washington offensive line can keep those monsters from Ohio State off of Pickett, could be a close game tonight. Well, you, you keep them off them by being able to run the football. Last year, Cody Pickett had a record-breaking year throwing the football, but the Huskies only won seven games. That's because they were 113th in the nation in rushing offense. This year, they've reestablished that attitude that they're going to be able to run the ball, and tonight, they have to be able to run the football to try to open up their passing game, which is really, I think, one of the big keys in this football game. Let's take a look at my EA Sports virtual wow. playbook. Wow. Here come the Buckeyes tonight coming out of the locker room. Here come the Huskies taking the field. Rich Alexis will be key. We'll be able to run the football up the middle because if they can run the ball, watch this. The linebackers will come up. The safeties who are both inexperienced will come up and that will set up the oh, big hello. play for Washington. The guy ran all the way. If you can run the football, you get the safeties up, which, again, remember Ohio State's breaking in young safeties and then you get one-on-one -on -one coverage to your guy, Reggie Williams. But to get that... You've got to be able to establish the running game. That's the going to see, in my opinion, the key to this football game is Jim Tressler's Reggie Williams got a night That's game good looking stuff. good there. EA Sports. But I think Cody Pickett to, to Reggie Williams is obviously their strength. But without a running game, it's a non-factor. If the Huskies can't run the ball against Ohio State, the Buckeyes have too much defensive speed to put pressure on Cody Pickett. Have to be able to run the ball to slow it down. That's a real tall order, isn't it, yeah. though? I mean, yeah. big old Darian up front. I mean, oh. Nobody really ran no. the ball that well in Ohio. So you could talk about new oh. attitude, new stuff. That's a humongous I'm just hit. saying, if they can do it, they'll they have got, success. They if they, they can't, no, in next segment, the prediction? No, right. no, no, I'm just saying. No uh, chance. You know, Charles Frederick is a name we haven't mentioned in the show yet. He's the other wide receiver on the other side from Williams and Dustin Fox. If Gamble's on Williams, oh. Fox has got to contain Frederick. Sure He's also real that's good. All right. Did you call for predictions? Yeah, I think that's will. coming up. No, nice. Go to the Thanks grill. Lunch? It's lunch almost to lunch the grill. <laughs> it's almost lunchtime, but you can't have lunch until you make a pick. We'll come back to Columbus after this. Poor old Washington. On Campus is presented by Outback Steakhouse. No rules. Just right. College Game Day, built by the Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. And in part by Budweiser. The best things in life are the things that are true. Budweiser. Real solid slate of games yeah. an hour and a half ago, Lee. You promised me some That's underdogs right. to watch for. Double digit underdogs to keep your eye on. South Florida, Alabama, Central Florida, Virginia Tech, Vanderbilt, Mississippi, and Wake Forest, BC. Keep your eye on those bowl games. I'm telling Let's you. Keep your eye on are you picking the, are they gonna win the game? Make it closer than okay. the expectations. All right. I, th I think Duke and Virginia is gonna be closer than people think. Duke returns about 20 guys with starting experience. And Mississippi State, old Jackie Sherrill gets to have a home underdog situation against Oregon. Keep an eye on that game as well. Time now for this game. Lee Corso, headgear predictions all time, 31 and 32. You need this one to get uh -oh. back to 500. Oh, right. you go for well, I think coming back home, everybody's talking about Ohio State, Maurice Claret. How are they going to do without Maurice Claret? I think people are missing the point. The Ohio State defense in a night game will be electrifying. The speed of the defense and the attitude of the Ohio State defense.